Hi, welcome to another episode of Arts and Pop Culture. And this is my very first brand new episode for the brand new year. And you're wondering who's the lovely lady sitting next to my right hand side. She's the one and only known as Christian Johnson. Christian, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for coming here to spend time with me and my audience. So, thank you. I heard you're a mysterious lady. So, one of the questions I have to ask, how did you get started start in the film industry? Because I was told through the grapevine, you love working in the movie industry. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a long story, but I came into working in the film industry uh, by way of the television business. I started out at um, working in local stations in New York, WPIX, WNBC, uh, uh, WNYC, which is now a defunct TV uh, station. And um, I navigated my way from the television business working in newsrooms to working in post-production facilities that edit commercials and do TV shows. And um, from there, I inserted myself into the film, in, uh, film industry. Uh, I knew no one. I did what, 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 used to, what was, used to be called cold calling. So I got the, this book that used to exist, and I think it still does now, it's called The Yellow Book. And it's a listing, and it comes from the mayor's office. And there's a listing of all the productions that are shot, that are done, film and television productions that are done in New York City. And um, I just started making phone calls. And uh, thankfully, I, somebody was kind enough to give you the opportunity. Uh, yeah, that's that. That's the short story, <laughs> you know. But um, you know, I, I I I moved around a little bit, you know, within the television business. So and, speaking um, of your television, mm -hmm. sorry, um, what was your first television job? Well, television in the sense of. The first television job was working in the news business, in the newsroom so at WPIX. Were you, were you an editor? No, I was not. I worked in the newsroom as a, what they call a PA, production assistant. Okay. And then I worked in what's called post-production, post-production facilities. And uh, I worked in two different ones, three different ones actually. All are now defunct. Yeah. You know, one was called Editel, Editel New York, Chicago, LA, and Boston. The other one was called, I can't remember the other, the other name. No, oh, they're defunct now anyway. Right. Um, so, you know, I got, I got my feet wet, so to speak, uh, being around the editing world where these, this facility, the post-production facility, was responsible for editing all, you know, uh, high quality uh, commercials, you know, and the advertisers were their clients and the advertisers brought them jobs such as Budweiser, all the product type commercials. Nice. And um, it was just an amazing experience just watching that process. So from, from there I navigated my way through from working in a newsroom to working in a post-production facility to launching myself uh, quite boldly into the film industry. And I, you know, I got an interview with one of Spike Lee's production managers. Oh, nice. And they were just finishing up um, Do the Right Thing and moving on to his next film, which was Mo' Better Blues. And I got on as an intern at first, and the internship turns into an apprenticeship. And by the time I, so I worked on film sets for about two and a half years, working in the locations department, working with um, other PAs and as a production assistant. And then I moved into working in the edit, editing department, working on a Spike Lee film. So I worked on five of Spike Lee's films, Malcolm X, do the right, not do the right thing, I'm sorry, Malcolm X, Mo Better Blues, uh, Summer of Sam, Jungle Fever, um, and there's one more and I'm just not remembering it right now. Well, so um, We can look that up right now. <laughs> So yeah, most of my credits are on IMDb. Yeah, that's where the place, that's where you have to be. Okay, yep, here it is. And Crooklyn, that's it. So it's Malcolm X, Crooklyn, Mo Better Blues, Jungle Fever, and Summer of Sam. Yeah, and she forgot to mention in Dreams, Well, those, I, I, was just, I was just mentioning uh, Spike Lee's films. 
but I did work on In Dreams. I worked with Ron Howard. I worked with Penny Marshall. I worked with Boomerang. Uh, I enjoyed Boomerang. Boomerang, yeah. I worked with um, Tim Robbins and Susan Sarandon on. Um, oh goodness, what was the name of that film? Oh, you worked on uh, Apollo, The Brothers from Cullen, right? Uh, Manhattan Murder Mystery, Clockers, Woody The Allen. Birdcage, yes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on and on and on. Big movies, guys. Yep. <laughs> So, you know, I, you know, so I've worked in the film industry um, for a number of years, a decade or two. Were there any jobs that you had to turn on and say, listen, this is nice, but I know it's not for me and I, you had to pass on the opportunity? Actually, no, I, to be quite honest with you, I had a very, very good uh, working experience. You know, the film industry is quite brutal, just like most of the arts, whether it's theater, film, uh, television, music, uh, it, it's, it's, it's highly competitive, you know, you're working with, a, you know, a myriad of creative people on different levels, and um, it gets, it gets brutal, <laughs> it gets pretty brutal. And that's um, all she can say on camera. <laughs> yeah, it gets, it gets pretty brutal, but, you know, you have to find your way around, and, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, I did, and you, you know, I focused on, on my work, let more in my work and 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 learning my craft and less on the socializing part which is socializing is built into the fabric of of, of the arts mm -hmm. that's how you get your next job and so on and so forth but you have to figure your way out you know I mean you, you have to figure your way through the the industry and and you know people will help you but I think it's it's upon each of us to figure our way out. You know, you know, you're, you're putting your person, you're inserting your personality into an industry that is full of egos. You have to just figure it out. It's it's not an easy it's it's not an easy thing to do, but you do have to figure it out. And I managed to figure it out, and I managed to Deal stay these. above the fray yeah. of a lot of uh, stuff. But um, so yeah, you know. I had a really, really good run. I, every job that I went for, I pretty much got. I was hired. Yes, you know, and you know, you finish if 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 the if if the film is like a three month shoot or four month shoot, um, and that's just production wise. I'm, in editing, it's a little it can be mm -hmm. a little longer, um, but uh, you know, you have a time period. You have a time slot. You know, you're gonna be working for three months on a project, so. A month and a half in, you have to start looking for your next job. Right. It's 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 it's, it's, it's important. It, you have to do it. That it's a hustle. It's a must. You know, this is you are freelance. You are not working on a just a regular job where you get a, a, a paycheck every week and you get vacation. Nope. You don't work. You don't get paid. You know, you That's got it. three months to work. Sometimes it's a month. Sometimes it's five months. And you have to figure that out. You have to manage your schedule in a particular way. And you know, we all figure it out, and we all make mistakes, and I wasn't any different. So you ever try to get, um, to break into the animation business? No, no. Wow, everybody that I run through, they never want to break into the animation business. I, maybe, I could have been influenced with different areas of film if I came in contact with those people, but that wasn't, you know, it wasn't like Part of your plan. It, it wasn't part of my plan, but that wasn't anything it wasn't part of anything that, before I got into the film business, that I was even thinking about. Animation is a wonderful, absolutely highly creative um, uh, medium, you know, and it's being used everywhere in, in, in a lot of films, and even now in, in, in documentaries, you know. So my hats my hats off to to animators and what they do, and how they do it. Um, but I I just recently because I'm I'm directing and producing a film. Well, I, we're, I will gonna, be, we're, we're yeah. gonna get to the good part. Yeah. All right, that's cool. Well, I hope one day you do get to crack into the animation business because it's very lucrative, it's very fun. Um, there's wonderful people there. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we have to get to the heart to, of, we have to go to the heart and soul of why Kristen is really here. And we're gonna discuss her uh, documentary. Most people don't know that Kristen is Kristen is a die-hard music lover. And what kind of music lover I'm talking about? House music. So tell us, how did you um, go about starting your passion project? And 
aptly named. It is a passion project. It's, it's uh, you know, it's something that I've been involved with and um, I've been involved with house music, I would say since probably the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And um, it's a genre of music that really is an outgrowth of the disco movement. And um, house music contains a variety of Different genres okay. of, of, of music. And it's, it's, it, house music is defined by the speed at which the RPM. So is it kind of like um, a little brother to, or a little sister to um, disco music or a distant relative? Well, disco was its foundation. Okay. Disco, R&B, funk, you know, and uh, it, 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 all of those genres make up what you, what house music is today. And house music, soulful house music is also uh, the parent of what people call uh, electronic music now. So it's safe to say you're a fan of Crystal Waters, um, La Bouche, mm -hmm. um, Hathaway. Right. Those guys, just a few yeah. names. Those are, those are artists and house music uh, singers and songwriters, again, that come from another era, Crystal Waters and some of the other ones that you mentioned. Um, so house music's been around for a while. It, it, you know, it was an underground uh, movement that has slowly come above ground. You know, it was, it was popularized. Um, it, it was, the movement was started in the 70s, early 70s. Um, actually, late 70s. Yeah, late 70s, let's go to late 70s. Yeah, late 70s. Um, and, you know, it, it's had its heyday at places, iconic clubs like the Paradise Garage, The Loft, Better Days, a variety of clubs here in New York City uh, that it was really, really popular. But The Loft was one of those clubs by David Mancuso Mm -hmm. um, who started the loft parties, uh, that was really, really underground. You know, you needed a membership to get into those parties, wow. his parties. And then he, you know, as time went on, it, it opened up a little bit to, to, to the public. But as, as well as the Paradise Garage, that was the, the iconic DJ, Larry LeVan. You know, that was, that was his house. That was his house, the Paradise Garage. I know... Um some people in the film industry had um, parodied house, the house music scene. For example, the movie A Night at the Roxbury, mm -hmm. those guys from SNL. Like, I, I watched it. I, I thought it was pretty funny. Right. Yeah, uh, well, you know, you know, people took, and they still do, take house music and the movement of that music uh, quite seriously. Of course. You know, um, house music is an, a, a fantastic outlet for a variety of people. House music was that genre of music where, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't um, accepted by society, you know, talking about uh, poor people, black people, Hispanic people, the gay community, this genre of music brought you in the fold. It was just, the music brings people together to dance, to release, to, you Forget know. Forget about the troubles of the world. Absolutely. And I would say, outside of house music, there's really no other genre of music that brings together that, that um, a those variety, those a variety of people. It wasn't gotta... just those communities. Um, it was really everybody. You know, if you go to any house music event today, right now, uh, anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world, you'll, you'll see what I call the United, the United Nations of people. It's everybody and anybody because it's 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 something about that vibe, it's something about what that music does to your mind and your body that allows people to just let it go, you know, escape into whatever zone they want to escape into. And um, at the same time, you're exercising, you're exercising your mind, and you're really having a great time. Well, I hate to do this, but I gotta play devil's advocate. Since you're a house music lover, who are your favorite musicians and why? Mm. Mm hmm. Wow. Yep, yep. I had to go there. <clears throat> Favorite musicians. I hate when 
I don't like that question because because That's for why what I asked it. Yeah, because for whatever reason my brain goes <laughs> Because there's so many, and I know that's a terrible response, but there are so many. But I, I will throw out a, a few. Oh, um, wow, you're prior, so nice. Yeah, prior to me, you know, um, having a love affair with, with, with house music, believe it or not, one of my favorite genres of music, music was straight ahead jazz. You know, so straight ahead jazz, like not the, the smooth jazz, that's fine, but straight ahead jazz. What's the, why is it called straight ahead jazz? Mm, I'm not absolutely sure about the where that term came from, um, but I, I I'm gonna assume it comes from straight, meaning the original straight, straight ahead, right, right there. From You're, the source. Right. You know, we're talking about straight ahead in the sense where, you know, the music. The computerized music wasn't introduced. Right. It was you're just absolutely listening to real instruments, you know, a real saxophone, a real trumpet, a real piano, not a keyboard. Well, keyboard, but not a computerized, mm -hmm. you know, synth. Um, real drums, you know, uh, like pure vocals. Wow. You know, straight ahead jazz, meaning you know the Miles Davis and. Dizzy Gillespie and John Coltrane and and um, those guys and women, you know, uh, jazz vocalists, you know, um, Sarah Vaughan and and uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Ella and Billie Holiday and 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 the list goes on. So the, I I say that to launch into uh, that was my first love. Believe it or not, I, I developed an appreciation for jazz at the age of like 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. Don't know where it came from, it wasn't like that that was being played in, in my house. I mean, there was a variety of music being played when I was growing up, but I, I, I'll say this. When I first went to the Paradise Garage and heard the beat, and that beat went through my body, I was hooked. Nice. I, was, I was hooked. It was an experience just walking into this club because it wasn't what's called, a, it wasn't a traditional club. And what I mean by a traditional club, when you go into a club in New York City, uh, you're expected, you know, generally you, uh, you know, as a woman, you go with your friends or you go with a guy and you'll get a drink and you'll wait for somebody to ask you to dance. And you'll, you'll be listening to music and a DJ will be playing music that you generally hear on the radio. Right. Um, in a house music club, it's it's different in 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 in, in the way it's 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 set up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's freestyle. You know, you go and you do your thing. You don't wait for anybody to ask you to dance or anything. It's just this big pot of of dancers and grooves, and the music is incredible. It's incredible. The sound system is different, um, and the DJ is playing music and 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 mixing music. And through those mixes, he or she is telling a story, right. and and you feel it. It's it's an, and it's a continuous. It's the, if the mixes are done well, and if the DJ is really doing their job, uh, it's like one song. It's just one song, but that DJ has to read the crowd, and feel what what the dancers want, because it's a dance party. Yeah, it's he's not there, a, he's there to supply the needs for the for the people. Right. Mm -hmm. It, it, a house music party, whether it's inside or outside, you dance. You don't stand around. You just don't stand around. So it's, what it's kind a of group. dancer are you? Well, I dance, but I wouldn't call myself a dancer. But I dance and I appreciate dancing and I know good dancing when I see it. So, um, but it, you know, going back to your question in terms of favorite, favorite musician and why? From house music, of course. Well, there's... In terms of uh, favorite musicians, I, I, the first person that pops in my head is actually a gospel house music singer. Really? His name, his name is um, Kenny Bobian. And then you have Louis Vega, who's a, he's a DJ producer, a, a band leader, um, and he's produced records. He, he, like I said, he also DJs. You have Josh Milan. You have Barbara Tucker, who's a house music singer. Uh, the, really, the list goes on and on. Um, and as, let me just say this about 
house music. It's it's a genre of music that was uh, started by black people. Mm -hmm. And through that that creation of this 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 genre, uh, you know, it what happens is the music innovated the technology that produces it, right? So I, I mentioned this uh, iconic producer DJ, Larry LeVan, who's no, no longer with us. He's, uh, he's with us in spirit, though. He's with us in spirit, absolutely. Uh, Larry LeVan helped to create the sound system that was, uh, it's called a Richard's, Richard Long sound system. Mm -hmm. And him and Richard, you know, worked together on creating that sound system that uh, was in the Paradise Garage in downtown Manhattan. So those gentlemen are the foundation for the house music scene. They're part of it. It's it's you know there's there's a many different parts. There's many moving parts, but you know the first house music song was produced out of Chicago. Okay. So Chicago is known as the birthplace of house music. Mm -hmm. There's some debates about it, but you know that's that's part two of another Ooh. another story. Um, but you know, house house music is the birthplace. We're gonna say it's in Chicago, you know, and Chicago has its own sound, you know. Just and I, like New York City has and its own New, sound. New York has its own sound as well, and it's all valid. Don't you know? worry, people. I'm looking out. <laughs> and um, so you know, and New Jersey has their own sound, and Philly. And you know all the different uh, cities throughout the United States, you know, and house music has has grown legs over the decades, and now it's a worldwide phenomenon mm -hmm. and movement, and I really mean worldwide. So, which country outside the United States has the most love and appreciation for house music? That's a great question. I can say this. I can say South Africa is the largest market, as far as my research. Uh, takes me. Uh, South Africa has the largest market within the genre of house music, and um, they call their house music "I'm a piano." And their their enthusiasts and their you know their audience, believe it or not, is much younger than here in the states. Right. You know, here in the United States, throughout throughout the country, house music is generally followed by, I would say, the age range would be like late 30s into 60s, mm -hmm. 70s, because those are um, the folks that, again, come from the late 70s up until right now that still follow the genre, still follow the music. So South Africa, but house music is very popular in Japan, in Croatia, in Italy, in, in the UK, in Germany. You'd be surprised where house music has traveled and, and just how popular it is. Okay, okay, all right. Wow, that's a lot of information. But I'm sure you have much more um, research to do for your documentary. It's ongoing. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So how long do you think it's gonna take for you to complete your um, project? Well, I wanna say probably another year or two. Okay. Excuse me, um, I've already, in late 2020, at the height of the pandemic, I decided to do a short film. And um, actually, it started out, I wanted to put together what's called a sizzle reel. And as I was during the editing process, we had so much footage. And uh, I, I decided, really, in the middle of the editing process, that I, I'd like to create a short film. And I did. And um, the short film was a little less than 20 minutes. And um, so we started in uh, late 2020. I brought together some of my filmmaker friends and pitched the idea to them. They loved it. And we began doing some guerrilla filmmaking because, and I say, well, guerrilla filmmaking is, you know, you don't get permits. You do what you got to do. You put things together. You go out there and you get the footage. And that's exactly what we did. And, um, you know, keeping in, keeping in mind that in late 2020, we're right in the minutia of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people weren't available. Um, a lot of venues were not gonna be available. 
So we did what we could with a small amount of money. We did not g ask any big funders for money. We had, went into our own pockets. We, it was primarily self-financed. And um, we, we pulled it together. You know, we had one, two, three, four, maybe four or five locations where we shot. I set out to uh, put, tell a story about contemporary house music. And what I wanted the centerpiece of the short film to be about was the symbiotic relationship between DJs and dancers, because there is a relationship between the DJs and oh, dancers. I thought your documentary was based on, all right, I'm gonna tell the history, the origin story, how it's moving so the public can know. No. All right. My, I decided to go in another direction because there's already been some uh, documentaries, uh, full-length documentaries. Mine was a short. I'm gonna expand it into a, a full-length documentary, but there's already some historical pieces out there about house music. I decided I did not want to do that. Um, I wanted to. I wanted. I wanted my story to be highly entertaining, very colorful, very sexy, very co uh, soulful. So I decided to. Go Focus to, on another angle of house music. Yeah, that makes and, total sense because most documentaries that I see on TV not really that exciting to watch. Right. I mean, I will learn a lot, but right. I'm not excited to watch it. Right. I was just very interested because I had not seen anyone tell a contemporary story about house music and just how exciting and fun and soulful the, the community, the house music community, is and there's a culture to it just like rap music and hip-hop has a culture um so does house music you know so since you're making a documentary with house music, like are you going to do a little segment hey if you want to learn how to dance house music i'll show you how the right way no oh. no that might be you know all of all of those little nuggets um will be in the telling of the story because you know 21st century the, the 21st century house music community and culture um, is, is, is just not known. And it's really fun to go to any one of these festivals and events, whether it's indoor or outdoor. Generally, uh, the outdoor events start at the end of May mm -hmm. when the weather starts to break, all the way through sometimes uh, late October, if it's still warm outside. Yeah. Um, there's always a free event in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Baltimore. Um, and other places too, you know? So, um, yeah, my story is a contemporary story about what's going on right now in the community, and there is a community. And I think, and I know through telling the, sto telling the, sto telling the story the way I want to tell it, you will, go, you will definitely find out the history through the mouths of producers and singer-songwriters and DJs and dancers they will touch upon that because what I'm going to do with the expanded version, the documentary series, is I'm going to travel throughout the country interviewing DJs and dancers and um, getting yeah. all the stories. There's all these other stories that surround the genre of house music. So is it a one-part documentary or it seems like... Good I would like it to be three parts. Maybe five. Mm. If you're feeling lucky. Well, a lot, of, a, a lot of the way I would like to tell a story is money, you know, uh, traveling, you know, uh, time, and, 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 and the deal I'm going to make with whomever is going to pick this up, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's going to determine how many parts. Every part is going to cost X amount of money, yeah. X budget, and the, you know. I understand. That's cool. That's cool. I hope you do have a three-part documentary. If you can't complete it in three parts, you maybe can complete it in just one. And you're good to go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Whew. Wow, wow, wow. I just so yeah, but the name of the film, the name of the short film is called The Music Got Me. The Music Got Me. So I was able to successfully pitch the idea to two 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 time Grammy Award winners, one of which uh, worked with me. Okay. His name is Sting International. And Sting International has his own story and 30 plus years in the music business. Sting International is responsible for, uh, Sting comes from uh, two different genres of music, reggae and house music. 
and he's the guy responsible for um, an artist named Jamaican artist named Shaggy. Yeah, Shaggy I know, did I know a song Everybody called Shaggy. "Wasn't Me," you know. <laughs> um, so I pitched the idea to Sting, and you know, you, you know, when you're pitching something, well, um, I pitched it to him. I spoke to him about it, and it it was a process, a lot of back and forth, back and forth, and then he decided he he would definitely work with me. And then I spoke to a couple of producer friends of mine, a cinematographer, a graphic designer, and then we had to find an editor. And we set upon, we finished production, we finished shooting, I, I, I did an interview with, and the other part of the story is about the young people mm -hmm. and how the veterans in house music are passing a torch to the younger generation because the younger generation will keep house music Going. thriving and going and I gotta tell you there's some absolutely talented young people out there uh, the youngest person I interviewed and it will be interviewing for the larger piece started when he was 12 years old he's oh, now wow. 16 and he's a beast Ooh. he's a beast and um, the other one well I actually didn't get to interview that young man his name is Justin Miles um, but I spoke to him and I gave him a little little part in the short film, um, I cut in some some video of him playing. But the other young uh, young man that I interviewed, who did start when he was I think 13 or 14, his name is Amir Brooks, and he's out of um, New Jersey, and uh, he is now in his early 20s. He might be 22 or 23. A beast, an absolute. I mean, it, it, it's like these young people have been here before. When I say, when I say they are so into this music that comes from, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, but they did their homework, they, they researched music, they, they educated themselves on sound and, and, and all of the different equipment that you need to use as a DJ, you know, um, and just, you know, making themselves very, very aware of all different types of music you know, in order to be a DJ, but these young people are specifically house music DJs. And they're playing for crowds that are 10, 20, 30 years older than them. And they are, they have the crowd in an absolute frenzy, absolute frenzy. Just very, very talented young people, smart. But that's what we want though. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, so that's another element of The Music Got Me. The short film as well as the film that will be uh, the, the, Did you, know, you get the to interview um, Gorgeous George, I think it was called? No. Oh, because I know he's a, um, popular too. And are you also into freestyle music with the house music too, as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just yes. making sure. Freestyle is, 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 is all a part of, of, of the dance music culture, mm -hmm. the house music, dance music culture. Um, you generally will, you'll see people dancing together but there's a lot of people that just go out into their own zone and free, free their mind, free their body. You know, they just let the, the music completely take over their whole being. And that's what it should be doing. That's what it should be doing. And when, when the music, there's a biology to this. There's a science to it. You know, once that music and that beat hits your body and your mind, it, you, you move in a different way. You know, you, 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 you learn things about your body. Oh my God, my hand can do that, my arm can do that. My, you know, it's amazing. It's a great feeling and it's a great, it's a workout. It's a great workout. It's a mental, physical, um, emotional and spiritual workout. And that's great. I, I, I don't know of any other genre of music that does that and works on every part of your body and mind at, at the same time. Oh, break dancing. Break yes, -boy. right, that's true. But is there a movement of breakdancing and b-boying now? And, and I'm glad you brought that up because if you watch anybody, that, any house music dancer, it's a combination of yoga, of, of uh, tai chi, of breakdancing, and just a little bit of other soulful uh, dance movements. That's house music. You know, you find a lot of the breakdancers that can dance at a house music party because it is it's such a physical form. It's such a physical uh, dance form. But again, back to the music. That's mm -hmm. what the music does to your body. So, name of the film? 
The music got, got me. Right. Okay. Because no it does get you. It gets you. Yep. When you feel the music, you feel no pain. Right. It gets you. Yeah. Also, here's one thing I forgot to mention to you guys. House music is also very therapeutic. If you're having a rough day, that music can definitely cheer you up. Absolutely. 100%. That's why it's a mind, body, soul thing. Mm -hmm, it's a mm -hmm. spiritual thing. <laughs> All right, well, guys, I just have to say this was a great interview. Kristen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you um, for having me. Thank you for being here. And also, if somebody wanted to reach out to you for a p potential collaboration, what's the best way for them to go about it? Um, they, can, they can email me at uh, kmjfilmworks at gmail.com. They can also get in contact with me. Via social media? Via social media. The music got me uh, on Facebook, on Instagram. The music got me film, and the website, themusicgotme.com. All right. All of those things. I'm, my website right now is 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 being retooled, reworked, Updated. but you know, but it's but it's it's still present. But the, the the new live website will the new website will be live probably in another two weeks, nice. maybe less, maybe less. It's happening right now. As we speak. As we speak. <laughs> All right, Kristen, thank you so much for your time. Guys, thanks for watching. That's a wrap. Until next time. Bye-bye.